Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, and welcome to our July 2022 extended eco session. My name is Francis Ochen uh, from the African Society for Laboratory Medicine. I'll be your host today. Our session will run for one hour and we'll take presentations first and then dive into the question and answer session. Please join the discussion through the chat room and we do have translation services. Please join uh, either the English or the, the French channel so that you can get uh, the services that we provide during our sessions. In today's session, we look at transforming cervical cancer screening in Africa, the power of human papillomavirus DNA testing. We are aware that survival cancer, I mean, cervical cancer is a preventable yet one of the most common cancers among women globally. And 19 of the top 20 countries with the highest cervical cancer burden are actually in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, a disturbing statistics. In 2021, the WHO recommended human papillomavirus DNA test as the preferred screening method uh, for cervical cancer. Today, with the goal of offering innovative diagnostic solutions to countries that need them most, Roche will share with us their continued support to efforts by government, policymakers, and funding agencies to bring rapid, scalable, and clinically validated HPV DNA tests for cervical cancer screening. And they will speak to their most up-to-date progress in this regard. Additionally, we will share experiences of adopting human papillomavirus DNA tests and HIV stroke HPV diagnostic integration from the Zambian National Cancer Elimination Program and the, D the DREAM program in Mozambique, respectively. And to take us through this, we have three distinguished speakers. Our speaker, the first speaker will be Dr. Peli Malebe, Dr. Pelly is a specialized molecular product manager at Roche Diagnostics. She holds a PhD in biotechnology from the University of Pretoria. And she was selected as the next Einstein Forum Ambassador for South Africa and represented the next Einstein Forum and her country at the 2016 and 2018 Global Gathering. She's a member of the Global Key International Honor Society, and she has received multiple awards, presented multiple papers, and uh, published many, many uh, papers as well. The, the, the second uh, presenter following Dr. Paley will be Dr. Paul Kamfa. Dr. Paul is the national coordinator of the cervical cancer at the Zambian Ministry of Health. He is also the consultant in the division of gynecologic oncology at the Cancer Disease Hospital. Paul is the local supervisor of the fellowship of gynecologic oncology offered by the International Gynecologic Cancer Society and is involved in the training of residents of OBS and gyne as well as our clinical oncologists. Our last presenter will be Dr. Fausto Sikachi. Dr. Sikachi is a researcher at Uni Kalimas and Dr. Fausto has a degree in medicine from the University of Rome and graduated with his PhD in 2015, again from uh, the, the, the same university. And, and his thesis actually was titled Elaboration of Intensified uh, Tuberculosis Case Finding Methods Through the Use of Molecular Tests in HIV Positive Patients in Mozambique. And subsequently, he worked as an attached researcher at the Department of Biomedicine and Prevention of the University of Rome. His primary focus is on clinical, social, and management aspects of HIV and AIDS services, tuberculosis, and HPV in Africa. Colleagues, join me uh, in welcoming our distinguished uh, presenters, and we will start with Dr. Pelly. Pelly, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francis, for that beautiful introduction. 
All right. So um, as Francis mentioned, the presentation today and this session is titled Transforming Cervical Cancer Screening in Africa, the Power of HPV DNA Testing. My name is Dr. Peli Malebe. I'm the Product Manager for Specialized Molecular at Rush Diagnostics, and I'm based within South Africa. We just want to start by taking a look at cervical cancer in numbers. We know that cervical cancer is the most preventable, yet it's one of the most common cancers in the world for women. 84 to 90 percent of cervical cancer incidences and deaths occur in low to middle income countries. And when we look at the ranking of these countries, 19 of the top 20 countries with the highest cervical cancer burden are right here on our continent in sub-Saharan Africa. We also know that women living with HIV are six times more likely to develop cervical cancer than women living without. And when we take a step back and we look at the number of deaths in 2018, there's been a projected increase of 50% by 2040 if there is no effective intervention. Now, with effective intervention in mind, the WHO um, published guidelines last year, and these guidelines involve vaccination, screening, and treatment. HPV DNA is now the recommended screening strategy. The updated cervical cancer screening guidelines provide algorithms for HPV DNA testing. We'll first look at what the WHO has recommended for the general population of women, and this is women living without HIV. The first suggestion is that HPV DNA detection in a screen and treat approach starting at the age of 30 years with regular screening every 5 to 10 years. Sorry, Francis, I think you'd muted me there. Can you confirm if you can hear me now? We can hear you. Thank All you. right. And then the second um, suggestion is HPV DNA detection in a screen triage and treat approach starting at the age of 30 years with regular screening every five to 10 years. There's also recommendations for women living with HIV and the age in numbers here has um, decreased from 30 to 25 years. The WHO recommends that HPV DNA detection in a screen triage and treat approach starting at the age of 25 years with regular screening every three to five years. Bearing in mind the WHO guidelines, we see that the Roche Cervical Cancer Portfolio meets the standard of care. The COBUS HPV DNA testing is the foundation of identifying women at risk. You know, we're looking at extensive trials and long-term safety data, and the test has reliable test performance, as well as easy system integration, and we bear in mind the end-to-end -end solutions. When we dive a bit deeper in the trials and data, Russia has been involved in three la landmark studies, namely the Athena, the CERTAIN, and the IMPACT study. Now, these studies involved more than 80,000 women that were enrolled. Um, this had consistent clinical performance of HPV DNA testing across multiple sites and populations. There was groundbreaking evidence used to write and rewrite clinical guidelines as we continue to see over the years. 80, there are over 86 published studies and 224 articles. Now, when we look at the test itself, the HPV DNA test is clinically validated. It is FDA approved and it is CEIVD compliant. It has an internal cellular control to protect against false negatives, as well as a contamination control to help prevent false positives. And when we look at the easy system integration, we see that the systems for this test are all fully, auto it's a fully automated work workflow, allowing to maximize walk away time for lab efficiency. Um, these systems also allow for seamless integration on the existing platforms, the COBUS 4800, the COBUS 6800 and 8800 systems. And later in the in the session, we'll hear from the two speakers, Dr. Fausto and Dr. Paul, as to how they integrated these platforms that were originally placed for HIV testing and integrated the HPV DNA testing on these platforms. Then when we look at the end-to-end -end solutions, I'm very happy to announce that um, the Roche COBUS HPV DNA test now allows for self-sampling, and this enables easier access for healthcare, and it allows for quick and easy resource scale-up. 
And then when we look at the development of digital solutions to support the program and patient management, this is also something that Rush is heavily involved in. I just want to delve a bit deeper now into the test itself. We know that Rush has led innovation in HPV, geno HPV genotyping, but what does our test entail? It specifically identifies the genotype 16 and also the genotype 18, as HPV 16 and HPV 18 are the most oncogenic of the genotypes and are the most likely to lead to cervical cancer. And at the same time, it detects 12 of the other high-risk HPV genotypes. I must also mention that this kit has an internal cellular control, enabling confident integration of self-sampling approach. You know, if we want to have self-sampling, we'll be allowing for a wider reach, and we want to ensure that there was, in fact, a human sample that was collected. And with the use of an internal cellular control, you eliminate false negatives. As I said earlier on, it really, really does give me great pleasure to announce that we have launched the HPV self-sampling CEIVD for COBUS HPV DNA testing. And I just want to take you through the steps of how this will be incorporating in testing. And it's very simple. It starts at the very beginning where the woman would collect her own sample. She would then hand this over to the healthcare worker and the healthcare worker would then uh, place this in the, in the cell collection medium for delivery. This is then transported to the laboratory sites where testing is then done on the COBUS 4800, the 6800 or the 8800. Once again, um, the message here is, you know, we're supporting integrated testing and end-to-end -end solution. Uh, we've been involved in self-collection innovations to try and have a wider reach and have access for our patients to receive the accurate diagnostics, starting with uh, the plasma separation card for HIV. This is exciting because it was specifically developed and innovated for our needs here on the continent. And now we're introducing the self-collection as well, which will provide more access. The main take home message here, however, is, you know, we've got the 6800, the 8800 and the 5800. The 5800 was recently launched and it uses the exact same assays as your 68 and 8800. There is no difference in that. It's just a smaller footprint and therefore allowing it to be placed at smaller labs with lower throughput. We saw with the COBUS 4800, 68 and 8800, where on our continent they were originally placed for HIV viral load testing. And then with the pandemic about two years ago, this opened up the systems to SARS-CoV-2 testing and we were able to reach more patients in terms of the pandemic. But there's an extensive menu on these platforms. And for um, the purpose of today's audience, I've just listed here hepatitis, HPV and TB. And then to close the loop, we're also looking at disease management, where we're offering digital solutions that will incorporate the whole end-to-end -end solutions. Now, this brings me to the last slide of the presentation, and we'll be looking at how we address challenges at each step of the patient journey. So as Rosh, we're there from the and we offer campaigns and educational material in the HPV space, as well as other disease areas. I've uh, spoken, I think, in depth about sample collection and where we play there. And then in terms of the lab, it's not just about placing the instruments there, but there's, we also offer consultancy to maximize lab efficiency. There's digital solutions, and we offer on-site and virtual training, as well as patient navigation tools. The idea here is that we should all partner together and have a patient-centered approach to improve healthcare outcomes. This would involve policy and advocacy, patient groups, testing, and treatment guidelines. Um, I guess I would like to close off by saying we're here to support you at every step of your journey. Just feel free and reach out. I'll hand over to Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Of course, I'm uh, Dr. Kamfa a consultant gynecologist who is uh, based uh, here in Zambia. At, uh, I do not have uh, any conflict of interest or anything uh, to disclose. So I would like to take you through the journey that uh, Zambia has taken in as far as uh, HPV 
screening is concerned. Of course, where we started from, in terms of uh, the cervical cancer screening program in Zambia, it was in 2006. And from inception, we have screened more than 1.1 million women. And we were using three platforms, particularly in the public sector, VIA, and in the private sector, cytology. But come 2019, we wanted a test which was very accurate, effective, and objective at the same time where we were going to have an increase in the equitable access and screening coverage. And this was a brainchild which then started in 2019. Of course, if you look at the color code of that map, it all started in Lusaka, where we have uh, coded blue. It was from the four sub-districts, that of uh, Chawama, Kamwala, and then we had to go to the peripheral part, which is Chongwe. A year later, we went to those red provinces in the eastern, the western, and southern. These were CDC-supported provinces. Of course, we had uh, good funding from PEPFAR and USAID. And in September 2021, what you are able to see now, the entire Zambia is the green picture meaning that the rollout was done. But how did we move? Of course, how we moved, first of all, in 2019, after doing that, we wanted to validate the molecular testing. And we had three platforms that we were using. During that time, we decided to train most of our providers so that they could be equipped with information and training on HPV and cervical cancer. And also we had our clinical guidelines for HPV. When these were nicely done, September 2021, we had to roll out. And when you look at uh, the platforms that we had, of course, I've mentioned that uh, we had uh, three molecular platforms, but how was the placement of the equipment in these uh, platforms? First of all, it was uh, based on the centralized lab at the same time areas where we were having qualified personnel and where we were going to be having also quality assurance. During that time, remember what was happening was that we were shifting from monitoring our patients with, uh, who are HIV positive with, with CD4 now moving to viral load. So we wanted a multiplex analyzer. And this is the time that uh, we had to adopt uh, COBAS. COBAS 4800 was adopted and we had to align our program with the existing infrastructure. Currently in the country, we have got 14 4800 and we have got two 6800 COBAS. Of course, we have got uh, other 13 molecular tests and 327 point of care tests. When we were coming up with uh, HPV, what we did was we had to come up with baseline assessment. First, we had to look our, at our current cervical cancer program. And of course, we looked at the gaps that uh, it had, and we looked at the barriers and the opportunities which were there in as far as HPV screening was concerned. And one of the important uh, things that we looked at was the target population of our women, particularly those who are HIV positive. We had to geo-profile these women and based on the uh, uh, characteristics such as uh, demographics and uh, population size, then we thought we could move to another level, especially looking at the workforce that we had. We made sure that we consulted the local healthcare providers, looking at their needs, also the patient uh, caregivers and also getting their perspectives. And we also consulted the advocacy groups and implementing partners because we wanted to hear their perspective and also getting that feedback. And we had good funding from the implementing partners and we knew we were good to go. Of course, when you look at uh, where we are, we have got 387 labs, which cut us for 2,922 but it is only 350 which have been equipped with analyzers. And if you remember what I told you in the earlier 
uh, we said that we have got 14 COBAS 4800 and two COBAS 6800, but we hope to upgrade to COBAS uh, 5800, especially that COBAS 5800 is able to do a lot when it comes to mouth disease testing. And when we started in Zambia as Minister of Health, what we wanted was to put women in charge of the collection. And we adopted a self-collection, even the provider collection. So when you look at uh, some of the performance indicators, how have we done from the time that uh, we said we start uh, using HPV. Of course, the program has been quite impactful in the sense that the clear objectives and the targets that we had set for our own program, it had to reach a success. If you look at uh, 2021, in the year where we had to do the rollout, the target for the women that we were supposed to screen, irrespective of the platform, was put at 300,000. And because we were starting, it was imperative what, that we start screening 10% of the target and using HPV so that by the time we are reaching 2030, we shall be at 70%. And we managed to do this in the sense that uh, we had to screen more than 22,000 and out of that, we had a positivity rate of 32%. We didn't have uh, much problem when it came to courier system of the samples. Reason being is that uh, everything was under the integrated system for mouth disease testing. So the vehicles that we were using for early infant uh, diagnosis, the viral load and COVID, they are the ones that we were also using for transport. And of course, we had to do the genotype and it was uh, quite successful. We came to realize that uh, 16 and 18, of course, were prominent. It doesn't mean that uh, the program did not have uh, challenges. Of course, we had uh, challenges and the challenges uh, pertained mostly to the interruption, realizing that uh, we had uh, issues that had to do with transport media coupled with uh, storage media. And also the monthly reports were not adequately filled in during that time. And if you look at what was happening at that time, that's the time that we had the height of COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, there was prioritization of the disease in which uh, COVID took uh, uh, the center stage. If you look at uh, the solutions during that time, of course, we came to realize that uh, the biggest problem in as far as the transport media and sorry, media was concerned, it was because of lack of coordination between the implementing partners because when you look at our partners, each have got uh, that geographical distribution that uh, they look at. So we had to, as a Minister of Health, we had to make uh, sure that there was this coordination such that uh, when implementing partners are buying kits, they have to buy a cocktail of big kits in which we are going to have the brushes coupled with the transport media and the storage media. And we had to supply all the centers with the monthly reports at HPV acquisition form. And we lobbied the government, especially when the COVID positivity became lower, that we needed to prioritize HPV. And of course, they had uh, to reach areas. That's where we were using a point of care test. And we had uh, scored some achievements, like what I told you, this is the time that uh, we started and we had to pace ourselves so that uh, we need to screen 10% and every year we increase by 20%. So we managed to, uh, to screen 22,000 out of that uh, 300,000. And of course, we came up with uh, the guidelines on how our women were supposed to be treated, particularly those who were aged PV positive and how the recall was going to be done. For us to have such success, to tell you it was because of dedicated and trained, motivated workforce that we had. And there was that uh, political will starting from the highest office in the Ministry of Health to the sub districts. And we wanted to own this program 
we knew that it's only us who can put ourselves on the trajectory in as far as cervical cancer elimination is concerned. And we knew if we are going to say we want to eliminate cervical cancer, we needed a test which was accurate, very sensitive, but very specific. Of course, when you look at uh, another factor, it's in the Ministry of Health, we've got very good management structure starting from the top to the lowest, where we have people placed specifically for cervical cancer coordination, and the funding is quite uh, good. To enhance the HPV uh, trajectory, especially with regard to cervical cancer elimination, Roche had to come up with uh, HPV virtual roadshows and capacity building. And I managed indeed to participate in these uh, roadshows. Of course, they were very educative and informative and it helped me interact with top doctors who are in the elimination uh, strategy, such as uh, Lynette uh, Dan, who is based there in South Africa. If you look at uh, the long term uh, that we have for our program, first, we want it to be sustainable. And what we want is, we want to reach 100% of the high volume HIV clinics and we want to reach the 100% district coverage. If you look at a district coverage, we have got 116 districts in Zambia, but currently we have covered 111 with HPV, meaning that we are around 96% coverage, and we seem to be on a very good uh, trajectory. Of course, there are those uh, hard to reach uh, areas, and this is where we now need the point of care uh, so that uh, a lot of women then are going to be uh, covered. And as a country, WHO has put us on the path of uh, cervical cancer elimination, and we want to embrace this. So what we have started is that we are going to be increasing the coverage of HPV testing by 10% while we are running side by side with HPV so that uh, we reach the 90-70-90 elimination strategy the way WHO has put it. And of course, we just have to increase our voice in as far as awareness is concerned. We have involved the media so much. And one of the important things is that for the program to be called that it is very strong, it is important for you to ensure that M and E, the process indicators, have been enhanced. And this is what we have been doing indeed as uh, a ministry. I would like to thank you and I acknowledge uh, WHO who have done a lot of uh, things, particularly for Zambia, where we are. And I would also like to thank Roche Diagnostic for this privilege that uh, they have given me so that I present uh, this to you. And of course, Ministry of Health. I thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Paul. We will move it on to Dr. Fausto Sikachi. Uh, colleagues, keep your questions and comments coming. And once we complete the next segment, we'll get into the question and answer sessions. Uh, Dr. Fausto, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here with you. It's a pleasure and honor for me to present these results. Uh, I will talk about this study we call HPV Easy Innovative Screening Initiative, in which we will give some results about this collaboration among uh, Dream program, uh, Sant'Egidio, uh, uh, Roche, and uh, uh, the uh, Central Hospital in Maputo. And um, so a study that is currently is running in Mozambique that it's giving many as uh, integration of each things uh, and in general supporting the feasibility 
uh, once more the feasibility of the uh, molecular screening as a first step for HPV. Uh, first of all, of course, I have to uh, um, in disclosure no um, conflict of interest. An health program that is now present in them countries in Africa, as you see here in the map, uh, it's a disease relief through excellence uh, and advanced means. Uh, it started in Mozambique 20 years ago and in 2002, so uh, now it's spread in many other countries, treating HIV, but then many other tuberculosis, non-communicable diseases, and so on. Here we have just few numbers about the uh, activity of dream program in the laboratory field so mainly in hiv uh, viral load and resistance testing hematology and so on. and then now also hpv molecular diagnosis that it's piloting in maputo <clears throat> so as i told you this is a partnership between community of sant'egidio dream program uh, Roche Diagnostic Portugal that supported this study uh, since uh, the beginning and the Maputo Central Hospital that is supporting in the uh, pathology part of the uh, pro project. Uh, as you know, Mozambique is one of the countries in the world, in Africa, with the highest burden of HPV and cervical cancer uh, cases and deaths. Um, here we have some data, some studies, uh, more than 4,200 new cases of cervical cancer uh, per year, more than 3,300 deaths, uh, with a, a prevalence of HPV infections that it's varying according to different studies and surveys, but quite high every in, in, in every uh, report, so some some say 63%, some other 75%. We will see also in our study high rates of HPV infections. Uh, currently, as in other African countries, the cervical cancer prevention uh, guidelines are still based on the VIA, VIA uh, so uh, that it's spreading almost in every health unit in the country. Yeah, that it's of course, as you know, uh, an easy to perform test, quite uh, cheap, uh, and it's recommended by the health, national health system uh, in, every, in every woman aged 30 to 55 years. And then in case of VIA positive, uh, the recommendation is to perform the cryotherapy possibly in the same day. Our study is conducted in the Dream Center in Zimpeto, that is uh, an area in Maputo, in, so in the capital city of the country. And uh, so it's the main activity of the study are conducted in this health center and also something, uh, some analysis in the Maputo Central Hospital. Uh, the main objective of the study was to evaluate the use of the HPV molecular testing as the initial screening test and then to see how many, for example, cryotherapies or colposcopies are done uh, unnecessarily in women that maybe were HPV negative. Uh, and we didn't know because we just performed the VIA test. So we integrate the uh, HPV a molecular test in the normal flow of the current recommendations to see what would happen if we would implement the new recommendation. This is the uh, flow of the study. So we enroll women aged 30 to 55 years, both HIV positive or negative. We follow on one side the normal flow, so BIA, and when it's positive lower than 75 percent uh, we perform the cryotherapy on site when it's more than 75 percent or a suspect of cancer we perform the cons col colposcopy and the biopsy and this is the part in which it's involved in the maputo central hospital but at the and then of course if they are negative we just follow up according to recommendations according to the HIV status. But at the same time, we perform also the HPV molecular test. So we can then 
compare these results with the HPV molecular status also. We first started with a training of local staff in July 2021 20, with Dr. Uh, Clara Bisho that came from Portugal. And this is the Mozambican staff involved. And after 12 months of enrollment, we enrolled 1,323 women. We see that the majority were HIV negative, but more or less uh, half and half. So we can compare the two uh, sub uh, populations. Uh, BIA positive was registered in 10.6% of cases. So 140 women were BIA positive with slight difference between HIV positive and negative women because it was 9.4% in HIV negative and 12% in HIV positive. <clears throat> what were the results of the HPV testing? We see here that 27% of women were HPV positive, so show some HPV infection. Uh, of them, the majority were others, and only 121 were HPV 16 and or 18, so single infection or co-infection 16, 18. Um, and we see that HPV infection was very different, the prevalence in HIV positive and negative women, as we expect, of course. But we, we remember the, the VIA positive was not so different between HIV and H, HIV negative and positive women, while the HPV infection is really, really different. In particular, if we look at the high risk uh, genotypes, so HPV 16 and 18, they were much higher in HIV positive women because 13.6% of these women were infected with a high risk uh, HPV strain. So uh, uh, really a high risk of developing the cancer. The concordance between VIA and HPV was not so good as expected or it was 71.9% and it was even lower in HIV positive women because it was 63.4%. So the cases in which the two test, tests were agree. Uh, among the 140 women that were VIA positive, more or less the half, 52.8% were HPV negative. Okay, so half of the VIA positive women didn't have the HPV infection. So maybe they had some other infection that was responsible for this VIA positivity. And among those without VIA positive, so with that VIA negative, 25.1%, one in four were HPV infected. So these are data that confirm what we know, but uh, so it's not something new, but they are, in our uh, perspective, they are important because they give us uh, some um, feedback from the, the field, uh, from a field that it's quite important because it's highly burdened by this infection like it's not. So this is what happened with the current screening approach. So we perform VIA, we have uh, this number here, it's in Portuguese, but I think it's clear, but we have 70 women that were VIA positive, but with the uh, HPV negative, four that were VIA positive and were sent for colposcopy that didn't have the HPV infection, so 74 total. And among the VIA negative, we have these 297 that were HPV infected. So this is more or less what I said in the previous slide. Uh, as we know, as it was already said, we have this new recommendation by the World Health Organization. We looked what happened if we would implement with this data, so this real life data, the fifth 
approach, so HPV DNA detection as the primary screening test, followed by the VIA triage, and then in case treatment. So what would happen if, and this is the simulation of what would happen with our 1,323 women, if we would have implemented this fifth approach in the WHO 2021 recommendations. Okay, it's quite articulated, but it's easy to follow. Here we have those with a positive HPV DNA test, so with the HPV infection, in particular those with the 16 and or 18, compared with the VIA results. And we will have these 86 women with this clock bomb, the bombas reloj in Portuguese. So women that are sent away now in the current guidelines because they're VIA negative, but they have the high risk infection. Okay, and so these now are no more lost infections, but we can follow up them because we know they have the HPV 16 or and or 18 infection. But uh, also here, something interesting, those that were HPV DNA negative, that if they would have done a VIA, they would test some time positive, uh, the 70 cases that now uh, are treated with the cryotherapy and they, that would have not have been treated. And now we are starting a new study to look what it's happening in these women, why they have the VIA positive, maybe a chlamydia or necessary infection, some other kind of sexual transmitted uh, infection or what else. So uh, this is, just a, a simulation with our real data, what would happen with this uh, new approach. So which are the lessons learned from our study that we want to underline? First of all, is that HPV more regular testing, it's feasible and easy to set up in, a, in an HIV care setting because uh, I didn't describe a lot about this uh, facility, the Zimpeto Dream Center, but uh, it's a, a, an health center with several uh, services, but also a laboratory that it's um, a reference laboratory for the viral load and other uh, tests. Uh, so the uh, addition of the HPV molecular testing was not a big task in this laboratory that was already used uh, to perform a viral load, HIV viral load. So this is just an example how it's easy, as we see in, say in the title of the study, to set up uh, this uh, HPV molecular testing, at least in HIV care setting. Um, then we confirm the high rates of HPV infection uh, rate in HIV positive patients in particular, and especially in, in for 16 and 18 genotypes. We provide data once more supporting the idea that screening approaches based on VIA are not the way because we are doing lots of uh, useless cryotherapies. Half to half of cryotherapies are useless in our countries that are only screening with, with, with VIA. Uh, and then at the same time, with these current screening uh, strategies, we are losing lots of HPV uh, infected women uh, that were 81% of all the HPV infected women. Uh, so uh, in our uh, perspective, these studies, our results are a, a, a confirmation from the, the, the field that these uh, novel approaches can be uh, implemented could be really useful for the health of our patients. It's urgent, it uh, must be speed up. Uh, future steps from our side, uh, we uh, are able to involve also larger courts of women in Mozambique or Malawi that are two countries in which our team program is quite 
developed and we know that are those countries with the highest burden of the HPV infections. We have more than 30,000 women in these countries that we would uh, easily involve them. Evaluate age in correlation with other particular risk profiles that I didn't show here, but we have those HIV positive women that maybe are also aged more than 50 years. So maybe they are infected with HPV since a long time. And so maybe the risk is even higher. Evaluate cost effectiveness of these approaches, because as I mentioned earlier, VIA is of course cheaper than HPV molecular testing, but is it cost effective? And then evaluate other levels of integration of HIV and HPV care, as it was shown before in the patient journey. And this is something that we are also uh, open to collaborate in. Uh, so I want to thank you all for listening. Thank all the Mozambican equipe that you see here in the laboratory in Maputo. Thank the uh, Roche team, the Roche Portugal team, the team in the Maputo Hospital for the uh, collaboration and uh, thank you all. Thank you very much Dr. Fausto uh, and all the three presenters. Very exciting presentation, very loaded and informative. We, we have covered so much from the platforms available and the kits their functionality, the self-sample uh, functionality uh, that, that provides ease of getting samples from, from eligible clients. We have also run through the Zambian experience, their journey to the scale up of HPV testing, challenges, key achievements, and some of the overarching facilitating factors. And we've done the final bit with Mozambique through their DREAMS program. Now let's get to the quick questions and thank you very much for having so many questions coming through and also the team from Roche and Zambia plus the Mozambique team. Thank you for dealing with most of the questions already, but we'll pick some and still work with them. I have the first question in no preferred order. The first question is coming in from Sabine and Sabine is asking, does the COBAS HPV assay also have WHO pre-qualification? Uh, I could pass this to Dr. Pelly. Thank you so much. We've got our medical lead on the call. Dr. Ida, do you have speaking capabilities? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, great. So we've had a submission done for a bridge assessment to WHO, and this is currently undergoing. So in response to that, so an abridged assessment has been with WHO and is ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for stepping in. Uh, we have the next question and we can still keep with the Roche team. The next question is coming from Abraham and Abraham is asking, one challenge with working with uh, some of the platforms from Roche's and, and his experience from HIV testing is that there is uh, the, 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 the fact that most of the, 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 the platforms are closed systems. And so they are asking for the HPV platform, is it a closed system? And if yes, is Roche considering opening up some of their closed systems so that it is more accessible uh, to the, the low and middle income countries? Uh, that's a very good question. Thank you for posing it. So our systems that are CEIVD for HIV, HPV, and your TB platforms, I'll, I'll just name them the 4800, 6888, as well as the 5800 are closed systems. And there's a reason for that. We undergo um, stringency and strict reagent protocols in order to keep it streamlined and have it be reproducible. We want what is being done in Germany to be able to be replicated in France, in Malawi, in South Africa. So for conformity's sake, we keep the systems closed. And in cases where you want an open system, we've got our life sciences portfolio where you've got your light cycler and your MagnaPure. So that's your extraction platform and your real-time PCR. 
but the kits that go on there are not necessarily CEIBD labeled. You would have to validate this within your lab and then carry it out as a diagnostic purpose. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pelly. Thank you very much, quite clear. Now, uh, before I let you go, the last question on your side, then I'll jump to other colleagues uh, for now. So you, you, you spoke about the self-collection swabs and Blandine is asking, is it a new Roche branded self-collection swab or this is one of the other ordinary swabs that are already available in the market? Yes, uh, another good question. Thank you for posing that, Blandine. So the swabs that we are using for self-collection are already available. It's the Copan and the Evelyn brushes, but these now are CEIVD labeled when used on the HPV DNA test. And we would offer this through Roche and Roche distributors. Thank you. Now, let me get to Paul. Paul, a very good experience from Zambia. And Mohammed is asking, are the tests free for the clients? Yes, Mohammed, the tests are free. The patients, uh, they do not uh, pay for anything. They are very free tests. For us, as long as it's uh, in the public sector, anything that has to do with uh, the testing, it's a free service. Thank you. And, and, and his next question is, uh, do you have partners? And I guess you probably already answered this, but you can throw more light. Do you have partners that are uh, supporting the, the acquisition of commodities that you use for uh, HPV testing? But also adding to this, is there any contribution from government? We have got uh, quite a good number of uh, partners, and I think I had uh, mentioned we have got, uh, of course, uh, PEPFA, USAID, and almost all the agencies of uh, USAID who are the implementing uh, partners. Then we also have uh, CHAI, the Clinton Health Access uh, Initiative. And uh, the government hasn't just uh, left it uh, to the partners. We also contribute towards uh, the buying of uh, the kits and the consumables. And again, that's why I said uh, we have been very grateful to WHO. WHO also had to come on board to try to supplement for the services. So we have got very good funding and implementing partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, the next question for you is coming from um, Amatui and Blessing. I'm going to merge the two. And the two are speaking to the fact that they, they, they need to know, uh, is HPV screening your first line as screening method? And how, how does this play with the, the usual cytology that we know is, is always uh, what we have known for, for, for decades? How is it playing out uh, between HPV, if it's your first line test, and then the cytology that we, we know most countries have been doing for, for decades. Uh, thank you so much for that question again. Like what I mentioned uh, previously, the first uh, screening test was VIA until 2021, when we said the first screening test is going to be HPV. But we triage HPV with VIA. We do not triage with cytology. Uh, thank okay. you so much. Okay. Uh, so uh, the next question, I'll throw it at uh, Dr. Sikachi. And, and, and this is related to the, the high positivity. We have seen it in, in Dr. Paul's presentation. 32% of uh, the, the, the people are screened, turning positive. You've seen also, you, you, you made a comment to the fact that uh, HPV prevalence is also high in Mozambique. Uh, Berlin, Blandine, sorry, wants to know, is this uh, positivity rate only among HIV positive women or we are talking about the general population? Okay, thank you for the question. But in our st 
study, we had both HIV positive and negative. No? And the data, let me, it was the uh, HPV prevalence was um, uh, 13.6% in HIV positive women. No, 37, 37.4%. HPV positive tests in HIV positive women, so 37.4, and 18.9 in HIV negative. So it's still high also in HIV negative. True. Mm. But the difference is even higher if we consider the 16 or 18 genotypes because it's 13.6% in HIV positive and 5.3 in uh, HIV negative. So it's more than double in HMV positive. Okay, Dr. Paul, do you want to make additional comment? You, you saw the same in, in, in Zambia with up to about 32% positivity rate. Yes, like um, we had not disaggregated that uh, 32%, but uh, it was for both the HIV positive and uh, the HIV uh, negative. We had not just disaggregated, but overall it was coming to 32% positivity. Thank you. Thank you. That speaks to the burden that we know uh, in, in the sub-Saharan countries as well. Uh, now, uh, my, my, my next question is coming from Anna. And Anna is asking, was there any patient's education campaign run alongside testing so that you then get the demand created for the services that you are offering? Paul, you could take this. Oh, uh, th thanks uh, so much. Of course, um, what we did first uh, in the first place, we wanted uh, to bring to the attention of uh, the caregivers and the patients what it means when the test becomes positive and what it means when the test becomes negative and the next step that uh, they are supposed to take. So when you talk of uh, counseling, it has been continuous. The time that uh, they, we take uh, the samples, up to the time that uh, we give them uh, the results, we continue communicating with uh, the patients. So communication has always been uh, there in the inception and given afterwards. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paul. I have a question coming in from Michael Miner. And Michael, very passionate about results getting to recipients of care. And he's asking, how were results being communicated to recipients of care? So what, what normally happens is that um, when we enroll all the patients, we normally get their phone numbers. Those who do not have the phone contacts, we normally ask uh, if at all there is uh, a nearest person who has got uh, the phone contact. In a situation, um, especially in the villages where we do not have those, they are what we call uh, navigators, at the same time uh, community-based volunteers who are able to identify particular people where they, they are coming from. So for those who have got uh, phone numbers, we normally call them when they are supposed uh, to come back or we normally give them the text. In a situation uh, where we normally know saying the results are going to be processed, especially that we have got central lab, within this period, we do ask them to come back to the facility, hoping that during that time, the results are going to be out. But when we know the results are not yet out, we do just call them so that uh, they do not uh, uh, come back. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very elaborate answer, uh, Dr. Paul. Uh, colleagues, we've reached the top of the hour and we have to wrap it up. I know it is quite an interesting piece. Uh, the chat continues to get a lot of questions coming. We'll compile all those questions and make them available to you. 
Uh, I will now ask our presenters to quickly wrap it up. But before they do that, I have to just disclaim that as ASLM, we do not endorse any manufacturer over any other. We just provide a platform for factual information sharing that can then support decision makers uh, for the key players out there. With that uh, stated, Dr. Pelly, please give us your closing remarks in 15 seconds. Thank you so much, Francis. I just want to say thank you to everybody who joined this call and gave us their time and their questions. Feel free to reach out and I look forward to partnering with everybody in this journey towards conquering cervical cancer on our continent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pelly. Uh, all over to you. Your closing remarks. There are two important aspects of cervical cancer elimination. Vaccination, and screening with a high performance accurate test. And the high performance accurate test is a molecular test. It's the way to go if us in Africa, we are going to put ourselves on the trajectory of 90, 70, 90 strategy to eliminate cervical cancer. We need to embrace the molecular testing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paul. And finally, Dr. Fauci your closing remarks. So thank you everybody for being here and for working in this field. It's actually useful and for the benefit of patients. And uh, thank you once more to ACLM for inviting us to present these results. We are open to any other collaboration to in our countries. So please feel, feel free to contact me and for questions or for any other uh, concern or interest thank in our you. thank you very much thank you very much and colleagues we've reached the end of our session today uh, certificates are available on our academy on our academy website and and we will be sharing the the code as and when it becomes available we will also have all the slides and the recording for this session uh, made available to you through our resource uh, platforms the online resource centers and then our whatsapp pages until we meet again uh, next thursday from me and the aslm team we wish you the very best of your afternoon evening and night from wherever you're joining us thank you and goodbye